you in peace from God's beloved. Please be seated. I don't need to go to church, he told me. I just worship God in my own way. I hear this a lot. You probably do as well. And another way I hear this is, I don't believe in organized religion. And to that, I always want to reply, have you seen my desk lately? There's nothing organized about it. Well, at least not at first glance. Chaos theory can be applied to my workspace. But I'm sure you've heard that sort of thing as well. And it used to really irk me when people said that sort of stuff. They didn't know need to go to church to worship. And when I heard that, I had all sorts of ready-made answers for those folks. Good biblical and theological answers as to why you need to go to church to worship God and not just do your own thing. I would point to the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit gathered all sorts of people together in an intimate community and say, there, that's where it says that you need to go to church. I would point out that Jesus himself made going to synagogue a priority to preach and pray with other believers. If it was good enough for Jesus, good enough for you, right? And I would suggest that the early churches gathered in each other's houses because that's the way God wanted them to worship. If God wanted, didn't want people to be in church, then why does the New Testament spend so much time in helping churches get along with one another? I would say that people need each other in order to grow. That left on our own, we'd simply repeat the same old patterns of thought and behavior and wouldn't be challenged in any way. Learning and growth happen best when in conversation and even in conflict with other people. Then I'd get all theological and say our God is a church. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, communing with each other in an intimacy so fathomless that we confess them to be one God, three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, circle dancing through the cosmos, calling all who are baptized in that name to join in their everlasting ballet. Ah. Sounds good, doesn't it, hey? At least I think it does. But my arguments always met me with kind of glazed eyes because I think people could really see what was behind all of that. They could see what I was really doing. That was just pushing my own church agenda. After all, I have a vested interest in people coming to church instead of pushing God's agenda. And God's agenda doesn't always include church. And that may sound like an odd statement, especially from someone like me who makes a living in the church. But you have to see what I mean by the word church. I mean church, capital C, institutional, where the church becomes a place of rules and obligations, power structures, and hard expectations. And I think that's what a lot of people hear when someone like me says the word church. It's no wonder they want to worship God in their own way. They hear pat answers to challenging questions that say more about the answerer than the questioner. They see theological finger wagging, making people feel guilty about what they do or do not do. And it's not until you experience for yourself what drives people's behavior that you have a clearer understanding of what motivates them. When I was the pastor in Lethbridge, I got a stomach bug one Saturday night. And my wife at the time, Rebecca, who was also an ordained Lutheran pastor, filled in at the church for me. And while folks were in church listening to one of Rebecca's whiz-bang sermons, a difficult marriage aside, Rebecca is one of the best preachers that I know, I was having a very different morning that day. Figuring I didn't have H1N1 virus that was going around at the time, and so I wasn't going to give anyone the swine flu, and I was feeling a little cooped up in the house. So I took our dog Zoe for a walk to the nearby gas station to buy a coffee. (laughs) Yeah, gas station coffee. (laughs) And I put my iPod in and listened to some podcast. I can't remember what it was, and and so while we walked. And from the gas station and my coffee, Zoe and I wandered over to the park. And I sat on a bench, she lay at my feet, and I watched some leaves blow around in the breeze. It was a cool autumn day. 
a little cloudy with a gentle, refreshing wind coming from the west, caressing my face. My heart tapped the brakes to slow down. My breathing quieted. So this is what God meant when God told Moses to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Because for me, it was a true Sabbath moment. It was the first time that I relaxed in a long time. And for those who know me know I have difficulty trying to relax. I don't sleep well and I have trouble turning my brain off. My favorite day of the week is Monday. I've only just started taking a full day off, mainly for health reasons, and I get stressed out planning my holidays. It's not that I'm wildly productive or so madly in love with my job that it becomes my intimate park or partner or that I have this like macho workaholic streak. streak. It's just that I have trouble sitting still and I like to keep moving. Maybe it's adult onset ADD, but I'm never happy unless my brain is engaged. But that Sunday morning in that park with that gas station coffee, I was able to calm myself having no other agenda that day other than to just get rid of that bug, I was able to settle down, put my mental feet up, turn the light off in my head, cool the engines for a while. I was surprised to find myself at that park listening to some unmemorable podcast that I was able to worship, to be silent, to pray, to connect with God outside of the church. So this is what people are doing when they're not in church on Sunday morning, I muttered to myself. I could get used to this. It's kind of like that song says, easy like Sunday morning. Was this worshiping God in my own way? Maybe, probably. But when Zoe and I wandered back home, I watched the cars go by. Many of them driven by people wearing ties or nice dress. A lot of folks, a lot of folks would identify as church clothes. Families on their way to and from worship. And I began to wonder if they were able to connect with God that morning. And I began to wonder at those at church listening to Rebecca preach, if they were able to connect with God while in worship. I wondered if they were having as worshipful a morning as I was. So what about you? Where do you worship God when you're not in church? What are you doing on Sunday morning besides answering your phone? Because <laughs> I know that when you're not in church on Sunday, most of you aren't sitting on a park bench. You're not relaxing at home. In fact, it's a very different day for you. You're not playing hooky. You have real life obligations that you need to take care of. Sports for the kids, work schedules, homework, community obligations all pull you from worship. And you come when you can because you still find value and meaning in our gatherings. Also, I know that many of you arrive here on Sunday morning trying to make sense out of your life or trying to figure out how what's happening in the world fits into God's beautiful vision for our planet. For many of you, underneath all your running around, dropping the kids off at soccer, hockey, or dance, and trying to get in some decent family time before heading out to a job you don't love, then starting it all over again the next day, and then there's me questions of meaning and purpose that may not have words, but still live inside your imagination. And you have those moments when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, and you ask, is this it? Is this really my life? Is this really what God wants for me? But for others of you, you look back at your life from a multi-decade distance and are trying to piece together the fragments of memory to tell a story you can be proud of or at least show how you've made a contribution. You see your achievements and your success and you see those times when you've overcame adversity and you became a stronger person. And you also draw in those moments when you were less than your best. Those times that shaped your life in ways you didn't want, but still helped create who you are. Those times when you acquired wisdom that you would rather have not received because it arrived in ways that disrupted the plan that you had for your life. 
And so your eyes survey your past, cobbling together a story that has meaning. But still, you wonder how your story fits with the story the world is telling. Or you open up your phone, you start scrolling, then the new, and on your news feed, it's filled with contradictions that leave you confused. You read awful news, like the van attack in Toronto and the misogyny that fueled it. And you wonder what God has to say about young men who hate that they can't get the women they want, so they resort to murderous violence against them. But then the next story is something completely different. It's good news. Like Kim Jong-un crossing over the border to shake South Korean President Moon Jae-in's hand. And then Kim Jong-un writing in a guest book at the Peace House saying, a new history begins now. The starting point of history in the era of peace. And you don't pretend to know or understand the nuances of North and South Korean history and politics other than what you've seen on MASH. But to you, this looks like a hopeful beginning. And so you ask, how does all this fit together? And so you come here, wondering if in the songs we sing together, in the scripture readings that we hear together, in the prayers that we pray together, in the word that is proclaimed in our hearing together, in the bread and the wine that we eat and drink together, a door of understanding will open to help you, to help us make sense of a world around us and within us. But the thing is, we do all of these things together. Good, proper theology says that the only reason we find ourselves at church on Sunday is because God puts us here. That God pulls us by the ears and plops us down in the chair and here in the sanctuary. And yes, there is some truth to that. But I also think that people like you, like we, we find ourselves here on Sundays because this is where we know that we will find Jesus or where Jesus finds us. Because Jesus is in God's word as it is spoken and in the sacraments as they're given and as they're received. Jesus is in the face of each one of you, you here, who come looking for a word from the Lord. And Jesus is in the body of Christ, of us together, assembled in this house of prayer and praise. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. That's his way of saying that we're all connected to each other through him. When one branch is missing, we are diminished. Something is missing. Someone is missing. We are the branches because that's where the fruit is. We are the ones who bear God's fruit. And while we are, our little branches extend far beyond the doors of that church to mix the metaphors, we are still connected to the one source of nourishment. We are connected to the one source who is Jesus, the vine. Jesus and water and the word, bread and the wine. Jesus and fellowship with other believers. Jesus connects us to each other, helping us to bear fruit that lasts from today and into eternity. But for most of you, I would guess worship isn't something you have to go to. Worship is something you get to go to. After all, you have a host of other options on a Sunday morning. But you're here, gathered in one place, to hear once again the story that gives you life with others who share that story. That's what I realized that day as Zoe and I were scurrying home from the park, also after realizing that coffee and stomach bugs are a deadly combination. I realized that church is a gift, that I need you to help me grow. We need each other to help each other grow. There's no fancy theology behind why church is important for believers, or soon to be believers, or trying to believe believers. 
I think we're here because we know deep within our bone marrow that this is where God wants us, even if it's just for a little while, to ask the tough questions of life, death, meaning, purpose, and eternity. To listen for God's voice in the collective proclamation of God's people called the body of Christ. And in the intimate quietness of your own heart, as you receive the bread given and the wine outpoured, and to connect and grow with the support and the encouragement of others, growing into the fullness of who God wants you to be and who God wants us to be. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus tells us. You are the fruit of God's vine, gathered to give nourishment to others as you have received nourishment from him. And may this be so among us. Amen.